Oh my Kako, this is Module 5A, Geological Aspects of Stone Implements. In today's lecture, we will go over why use stones for tools, what makes a good stone for tools, geochemical analyses of stone tools, as well as stone quarries. As a reminder, your quiz for Module 5A is due. Um, I've extended the deadline to Tuesday at 12 a.m. There are two readings that accompany the lectures, Kanin 1997 at um, pages 92 to 95. Um, this is by Herb Kwaini Kane, a renowned artist and one of the founders of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, as well as Hiroa 1957, Arts and Crafts of Hawaii. And this is mostly for your reference for pictures and if you want a more detailed information of um, any of the implements or tools that are described in this lecture as well as Lecture 5B. Both can be found within the Resources tab. If you want to cut down a tree, build a canoe, or wage war, or even scrape out meat of a coconut, or cut meat from a pig, you need to make tools. Today's lecture is largely going to talk about the koi, or the ads. Koi are axe like tools that were used to cut down trees to make canoes and houses. They were highly prized and intertwined with the economical and political systems of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and Ali'i, or chiefs, had full control over the quarries and used them for trade and political gain. Here in this painting, taken from the Herb Kane reading that um, is in the resources tab for this week, you'll see this painting is named The Ads Maker. In the upper background of the painting, it depicts a man working with ancient with the ancient quarry on the mountain of Mauna Kea. The worker swings a large hammer stone between his legs against the edge of a salt boulder core. If struck correctly, large flakes are produced of which some may be selected as adze blanks. In the upper left, an adze or a koi is being shaped by a craftsman using a, sim a smaller hammer stone to remove flakes from both faces of a blank. This work was usually done at the quarry, after which the roughly shaped blanks were carried down the mountainside to a workplace of a master. In the foreground, a master craftsman does the final flaking to produce the distinctively shouldered end shape of the Eastern Polynesian ads. Each flake sets up further flaking by leaving what may be called a striking platform against which the next blow of the hammer stone may fall. As this the size of the flakes becomes smaller and smaller, the overall shape of the ads becomes more refined. After the final flaking, a craftsman at left grinds the ads against a wetted slab of fine grain stone, using as grinding mediums paste of various abrasives mixed with water, with more water added at intervals. An hour or two of grinding was required to produce flat surfaces that tapered to a shoulder blade, to a sharp blade. Tools dulled by use were sharpened further by grinding. The figure at the right is lashing an adze or a koi to a half carved from a section of tree branch from which a thinner branch, the handle, has grown at an angle of approximately 70 degrees. The stone is set against a shock absorbing cushion of bark cloth and lashed upon the braided sediment or lashed with braided sediment. Um, and senate is made from the husk of the coconut, coconut fibers. So these are the words of Herb Kawaini Kane. Um, he did a lot of research upon which he based his artwork on. So lacking metal, um, Polynesians made tools out of stone, like the koi, shown here in order for them to complete the work that they needed for everyday life. So the question here, is one stone as good as another? Well, vesicular pohoihoi forms when gas and bubbles are frozen into cooling magma. Vesicular pohoihoi 
Lava makes a lousy as or coating, but an ex but is excellent for grinding or polishing stone, as described by um, Herb Connie in the previous slide. Coarse grain rocks make crumbly courtly or ads, but are excellent sinkers and lures. And glass is best for cutters and scrapers, but hard to find in large pieces. And as a reminder, glass is formed by rapidly cooling magma. So what makes a good source rock for an ads or a courtly? Fine grain rocks with even side grains is best. They need to be able to fabricate and hold a fine edge without breaking. Excellent koi do not have many vesicles. Bubbles are structural defects. Aaflow interiors, dikes, and some massive alkalic lavas are good examples. Koi need to also not have very many large crystals as crystals are defects too. This can be found in post shield, alkalic rocks, and some shield lavas as well. Finally, fractures. Previously fractured outcrops save a lot of labor. Columnar jointed lavas and dikes were widely exploited sources, usually cooling of Mauna Kea lava, or unusual cooling of Mauna Kea lava that pounded against ice for another great source. And here in this image, you can see examples of um, various koi from the Bishop Museum collection. I highly recommend if any of you have not been to go to Bishop Museum and check out the amazing artifacts and collection that they've created, not only for Hawaii, for much of the Pacific. So making tools from raw stone, as shown um, some of the steps in more detail here in this image, the stone must withstand fabrication and not break when being used. So in today's lecture, we're going to further explore the role of geochemistry and petrology. So from a geological perspective, geochemistry as well as petrology or the origin, small scale structure and composition of rocks can be useful to understand how cultures used and were influenced by Pohaku. Any rock can be described in terms of the texture, the minerals it is composed of, and its chemical composition. Although Polynesians largely selected rocks based on physical properties, such as texture and fracture characteristics, the best method for sorting, sourcing artifacts is through the use of quantitative geochemical data. This allows us to match an artifact, such as a stone, implement to its source. This is done by asking, does an art artifact have the same texture, mineralogy, and chemical composition within uncertainties to a known source, such as an outcrop, volcano, or even an island. Because chemical data are fully quantitative, it allows for realistic uncertainty estimates to be determined. Before we move further, we need to talk about two types of uncertainty. Analytical uncertainty is the first type of uncertainty. This is important because different analytical methods have different inherent errors. Two critical analytical issues are precision, the ability to reproduce an analysis, and accuracy, the correctness of that analysis. Next, we need to look at the quarry themselves, where the stone implement, such as a koi, is created. How variable is the actual source area or quarry where the ads was created? This can only be determined from dedicated investigations of specific quarries. In this table below, we see the chemical data for Iao ads quarry located in the Northern Marquesas. The data is represented from an average of 17 analyses. By comparing the chemical data between ads or quarry and suspected quarry, we can gain useful information on the voyages and travels of early Polynesians. Archaeologists use artifacts such as koi to make interpretations about what is known as spheres of influences. The map here shows some known and suspected interactions based on ethno-historic sources and documented transfers of artifacts. 
These early interpretations are largely based on macroscopic appearance or stylistic similarities. Things that can be seen visual with your two eyes and do not require a microscope or geochemical analysis. Here is an image of a koi from Honolulu Harbor. And you can see on the right that it is approximately 37 centimeters. These two images on the left are taken using a petrographic microscope. What they do is they make a thin slice of a rock, such as the koi or a rock from its source, and they pass light through it. The top image is from the ads at Honolulu Harbor, and the middle image here is a sample that was collected from a koi core at Pu'u Papa'i Moloka'i. In both images, we see an apatite crystal here in the light brown, which is a mineral found in the basalt rock. The bottom image shows Pu'u Papa'i Moloka'i. The table on the right shows the chemical analyses of the koi and their source koi. The ads from Honolulu Harbor is shown in the first column on the left and the ads found on Kauai is shown in the second column. You can see here from the similarity of the data that both were made from the same quarry on Molokai. If we take a look at this map here, this is a map of Polynesia with Hawaii here on the top, Easter Island or Rapa Nui in the east, and Aotearoa, Aotearoa or New Zealand here in the southwest. There are approximately 15 ads quarries or koi quarries that have been identified in Hawaii alone. The largest quarries are on Mauna Kea, Tatago, Matau, Samoa, and Eau, the Northern Marquesas. Geochemical evidence as described above shows major interactions within archipelagos and limited interaction between archipelagos. From the three main quarries, we see ads from Tatagamotau, Samoa, found in the Cook Islands and possibly the Line Islands, shown by these two arrows here. Koi from Iao are found throughout the Marquesas on Moorea, Mangareva, shown by arrows 3, 4, and 5. And there are various ads quarries in Hawaii, showing evidence of ads being transported between all islands as well as as far south as the Tuamotus. This is approximately over 2,500 miles. I also want to remind you that the Tuamotus are an atoll island with no basalt material, thus it was necessary for koi to be imported. We also see koi exchange between two of the most remote places on Earth, Rapa Nui, as well as Henderson Atoll. If we take a closer look at the quarry types from a geological perspective, we see that they are typically composed of outcrops of columnar lava as shown in the image below. Dikes, massive or large lava flows, and massive flows that are tilled against ice such as Mauna Kea are also an important source. Dikes may be composed of residual deposits such as dike boulders and dike rocks found in stream beds. Here is an example of an ads or koi material created in the Iao quarry in the northern Marquesas. If we take a closer look at this map here, we see that large squares represent documented quarries. You can see that all inhabited islands of Hawaii had at least one significant quarry. And again, this is um, Mauna Kea, which we're going to talk about in more detail further. So here is a map showing ads quarries on West Molokai. Kalua Koi, or the ads pit, 14 separate ads sources or koi, ko koi sources are known, and most quarries are on post shield lavas, but not all. There's one dike quarry.
your images um, of Koi as well as those flakes that are created during their construction. And here is an image of Pu'u Mo'iri adds Kori or Koi Kori located on Koho'olawe. At least one Mo'iri app or Koi has been found in an archaeological site on Kauai. Here are images from um, Koi as well as Koi flakes found on the Nu'u Kori in Maui. And here is an image of Mauna Kea, the tallest peak in Hawaii, located on Hawaii Island. We're going to end today's lecture with Mauna Kea, and some of you may be familiar with the clothing line Kealapiko. They have done an amazing job at using clothing and fashion to share the stories of Hawaii. I'm going to read an expert from their blog. Black is a deep pole, generative Generative darkness and with starlight density, the stone used to make Olopu came from the clashing of gods, the meeting of a volcanic eruption with a glacier. And Olopu refers to a specific koi. This specific run in of Pele and Poliahu atop Mauna Kea produce some of the finest basalt in the Pacific. Hawaiian ads makers recognize the supreme quality of this specific layer of stone quarried it extensively in a place they named Kianaka Koi and used it to make a range of koi big and small. It may have been Wakea who fashioned Olopu. One old chant talks about him as the wet stone maker, using sand and snow melt from Mauna Kea to grind and sharpen the stone. Olopu was used to carve Wakea's own canoes and was handed down through generations of chiefs, namely those of Hawaii Island. With it, they consecrated their most important work projects, like carving images for temples and making canoe fleets, endeavors that grew and maintained chief, chiefly status. Olopu is eventually inherited by Hawaii Kuauli, son of Lilinoi and Ku Kaha, Kahaula. In their deity forms, they appeared as the mist and fire rain of the mountain and the snow and the red glow of sunset. You can see here in this middle image. In her human form, Lily Noi was a famously beautiful chiefess raised in isolation in a cave on Mauna Kea, where she drank the water of a spring called Poliahu. One story says Kamehameha's name honors Lily Noi's upbringing in a solitary place on this mountain of great importance, whose sacred peak is the highest point in the Pacific, Makahi Mehameha. Olopu surfaces again during Kamehameha's rise. Kamehameha is shown in the image on the left. The scent of this warrior chief whose mother craved the eye of the tiger shark when he was in her womb. Atika torn apart the special storehouse where Olopu was kept and taken it to Maui chief Kalani Kupule. When the news reached Kamehameha that this koi of great mana and antiquity had been stolen, he traveled to Maui to find it. This was a convenient pretense for waging war on Kalani Kupule. At the Battle of Kava'a Nui, named for the purported 8,000 canoes that covered the shores from Hamoa to Kavai Papa, Kamehameha's forces defeated a battalion under the command of Kapakahili. He was one of Kalani Kupule's generals, and he had Olopu in his possession. When Kapakahili fell in this clash of forces, Kamehameha took hold of this koi na'i aupuni, the nation building ads, and build a nation he did. He went on to win most if not all of his subsequent battles and bring the islands under his sole rule, creating the foundation of our modern nation. Many different koi were used to carve the tools Kamehameha used in his quest. Massive canoe fleets, various ku idols, thousands of weapons for his warriors. Certainly koi, koi were used to fashion the images that stood on Pu'u Kohala. And just a reminder, Pu'u Kohala is the heiau that we talked about in Lecture 5b. The heiau he erected as per the advice of the kahuna who prophesies his rise to power. Yet this one koi stands apart from the rest. Why? 
Olopu is called the Ko'i Ha'i Kutuna, the ads that tells of genealogy, of the many ancestors who held the same Ko'i in their hands during their own rituals and battles. Its present at, presence at these times means it carries in it their chants, prayers, and language. It is this accumulated ike, knowledge and experience, that made this ko'i so special. When it came into Kamehameha's possession, it linked him all the way back to Wakia, one of our most remote ancestors. Olupu is even mentioned in chants for Kamehameha's descendants of the kingdom era, calling forth its mana into their leadership. For Olupu to have survived the ages, absorbed their mana, and come into the hands of this chief now, well known to people both inside and outside of Hawaii, is truly amazing. Where this Koi lies now is the last part of its story that needs to be discovered. So I'm going to end today's lecture with that um, mo'olalo or story that was shared by the Wahine, the women of Kialapiko. I've included the link here on the bottom of the slide, if you'd like to read it in its entirety, they also um, speak to the folks or the group of people that were able to do the research um, that is embedded in this story. So again, a reminder to complete your quiz um, by the due date, quiz 5A as well as quiz 5B. Good luck.